Mr. Epstein, the Beatles have tended to overshadow all the other artists you have uh, working for you or for whom you work. What sort of size of empire have you got now? Um, we have seven acts. I call them acts because five of those are groups and two of them are soloists. That's um, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, which is a separate entity, his backing group, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Tommy Quickly, The Foremost, Scylla Black, and Sounds Incorporated. And what about the administrative staff to support all this? What well, it varies slightly, because um, we've just moved into London, mm -hmm. and we're gathering new staff, but um, it's approximately 25. And what sort of size of empire is it in terms of money? One's read some staggering figures that the Beatles have earned for their recording company mm. in the last year. What sort of turnover does this empire produce? I couldn't give you an answer to that. I really don't know. Because don't forget that the company has only... the companies which can uh, manage these artists, to which they are contracted, has only been in operation for June... since June 1962. Mm -hmm. The papers have been... A accusing you of being Mr. 25%. If the turnover is as big as we were implying then, this means a very large income from you. Is it, in fact, a lot in the entertainment business? It isn't. It isn't. And uh, one's profits from that 25% in this business are not really fantastic because my own personal expenses in connection with the management of artists are quite fantastic, really. What sort of expenses are those? Well, when I fly to America, or I fly to America in order to um, fish around to see, to arrange bookings and so on and so forth, uh, I pay my own fares. I can, if, if I contract um, the Beatles to, say, the Ed Sullivan show, he'll pay fares for the boys and possibly their road matches, mm -hmm. but I don't consider that I can, uh, that he should pay my fare because I don't strictly travel with them wherever they go. So wherever I go, I have to pay my own expenses, and that all comes out of that 25%. Plus, of course, uh, for that 25%, we um, arrange for them to have all their photographs, we arrange their transport, and the, you can imagine the telephone calls that we make on behalf mm -hmm. of, say, the Beatles, which is sort of worldwide, really. Mm -hmm. Immense telephone bills. Tremendous, yes. Well, it seems a funny sort of world for a young man like you to be in. How did you get into it? How did you start? I started uh, whilst I was in charge of the records division of a family concern of which I was and am, as it happens, still a director. Uh, we were asked, or I was asked, by a young boy for a record by a group by the Beatles, and it always had been our policy in records to look after whatever request was made. And I followed up this inquiry. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and it was only after a week or two that he told me that they were, in fact, a Liverpool group. I, I assumed, for some reason, that they were from Germany. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he told me that they were a Liverpool group and that they'd just, in fact, returned from Germany and that they were playing in a club called The Cavern, uh, about a hundred yards away from my office, and I arranged to go down there, and I saw them one midday session. This is a pretty, and at the time, it was a pretty, uh, pretty much of an eye opener to go down into this darkened, yeah. dank, smoky cellar in the middle of the day, uh, and to see crowds and crowds of kids watching these four um, young men on stage. They were sort of f rather scruffily dressed mm. in, in the nicest possible way, or I should say in, in the most attractive way. Mm -hmm. um, black leather jackets and jeans, uh, long hair, of course, and a uh, rather untidy stage presentation, not terribly aware and not caring very much what they, s what they looked like. I think they cared more even then what they sounded like. Mm. I think they still care more what they sound like. Obviously, they know the importance now of what they look like because of, you know, television and so on. The changes in their appearance, are they due to you? Have you encouraged them to go to dress in such a way and so on? I would say that it was due to the five of us rather than to me. Um, I encouraged them at first to get out of leather jackets and jeans and that I wouldn't allow them to appear in jeans 
uh, after a short time. And then after that step, uh, I got them to wear, I think, sweaters on stage. And then, uh, very reluctantly, eventually suits. I think it was for their fir one of their first sort of major appearances. I'm not sure they didn't wear their first suits for a BBC broadcast to a live audience. These suits with the beetle collar uh, are, in fact, a, a German uh, type of jacket. I first saw them in Germany some years ago. Did the boys choose this type of suit, or you? Uh, they did, actually, um, very much with my approval. I thought it was an excellent design at the time. Uh, it quickly became sort of rather overworked mm. and no longer sort of interesting for them to wear. But uh, they first discovered that, I think, the idea originated from France, Pierre Cardin. On that day you first went to the cavern and saw the Beatles, did you talk to them then? Yes, I did. Yes, I met them. You'd spotted their talent. You'd seen they had something. Did you sign them up there and then? Oh, no. No, I've never done that with any artist. In actual fact, I commenced to go around with them almost a week or so after having first met them. Uh, and then they, we worked out a basis for an agreement which they didn't actually sign, and I didn't actually start to take anything out of their money, of which there was very little in any case, um, until, oh, about four months afterwards. Uh, actually, the first meeting that we had, the first business meeting we had, we held at my store. It got off to a very late start. It was quite, quite amusing, really. Um, three of the boys arrived at the appointed time at four o'clock. I was very busy ordering records for Christmas, and uh, Paul didn't show at all for at least three quarters of an hour and I was a bit put out about this I thought this is the first meeting they want to do something about management and so on and I asked one of the boys to get on the phone to him and he came back and he said well he's just got up he's in the bath so I sort of you know <laughs> shouted about a bit and I thought this is very disgraceful indeed and uh, how can he be so late for an important thing and um George just simply replied, it was very typical of them, well, he may be late, but he's very clean. Yet you picked these boys, who've now gone right to the top of all the available trees that there are for them. Why? What, what was it about them? I liked them enormously. I immediately liked the sound that I heard. I heard their sound before I met them. Mm -hmm. I, I think, actually, that that's important, because... Uh, I think that it should always be remembered that, in fact, people hear their sound and like their sound before they meet them. They are important. But I was... I immediately liked what I heard, and I thought that it was something that an awful lot of people would like. They were fresh, and they were honest, and they had what I thought was a sort of presence and... Uh, this is a terrible, vague term, star quality... Whatever that is, they had it. Or oh, I, I sense that they had it. This honesty, is this going to go the way of all flesh? Is it going to be corrupted by time and the exposure that they're subject to? Certainly not. I think that actually that they will go in the reverse direction. They will become more honest and even less phony. They're not phony at all, but uh, I think that they're so aware of this simple... Uh, presence that they project. I was interested in one thing you were saying then when you first saw the Beatles. They appeared to have little idea of stage presentation, uh, which implies some sort of knowledge or feeling for that for yourself. Have you had any such training? Yes, I was studied at RADA for 18 months, uh, prior to going, or going back, I should say, into the family business. Well, let's get your education organised properly. Let's talk about your family so that all this fits into context. What sort of family uh, is your family? Uh, middle class background, perhaps a little better, shop, you know, retail stores, uh, old established, started by my grandfather, uh, principally in furniture. When I left school at the age of 16, I had ambitions to be a dress designer uh, and also to be an actor, but my family weren't very keen on this and I allowed myself to be swayed uh, into going into the business. I think I was more anxious to leave school than anything else, which I didn't enjoy very much. Which school was it? Reakin College, Shropshire. Mm -hmm. Went into the family business and I did an apprenticeship for a furniture company outside of ours for about six months 
and then uh, found myself back in the family business and interested myself in the display and advertising side. In fact, uh, we opened um, a store specifically for me to work in uh, and develop interior decoration, which I was rather interested in. But by the time I got to 21, I was still feeling this sort of bug about acting and mm. the stage and so on. And I remember one day an actor who I admired tremendously said, uh, I, I was chatting to him and I was sort of admiring his ideas and so on and so forth, and he said, uh, I said, you know, it's, I feel so much like an old man. And he said, what do you mean you're only 21? He said, you could go to RADA. I said, I thought so I could. I decided then to take an audition, which I passed, and um, the director of RADA at the time allowed me to get in rather quickly. But I think by that time I was too much of a businessman mm. to enjoy being a student, and I didn't like being a student at all. And when this opportunity was presented again, to rejoin the family business in records, I was rather attracted by it because it still had, I suppose, a bit of a mm -hmm. glamour of the theatre and stage left. And I thought that it would be the best thing. And I enjoyed this very much indeed. I found I liked working in records as much in classical as, as in pops. What, uh, what sort of musical interests had you had while you were at school? Were you interested in music then? Yes, I was taught to play the violin. And I was very interested in classical music. I used to go to a lot of concerts in Liverpool. And um, I, I didn't really have a lot of time for pops until I was very much in the record business. Mm. I mean I mean the retail side. Yes. And I used to go and see a lot of pop shows and packages and so on. The musical interests you had, do they make you feel that um, the sort of music you are handling now is worthwhile? In other words, I'm saying, do you think that modern pop is is good music? I don't know about it being good music, but it's an art form anyway. An art form? You pitch it as high as that? Right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Do you know enough about music to have an, any say in the actual uh, composition or recording or arrangement of numbers? I don't know about music, but I know about... I think I know about hit songs, hit numbers, hit sounds. Uh, is there anyone in the recording studios with whom you might possibly clash over this sort of issue? George Martin is the uh, Beatles and many of my other artists' recording manager. Uh, but we get on extremely well, fortunately, and we work very closely on what is recorded. Once titles are decided upon, uh, the rest is really left to him. I sit in on a lot of sessions and so on. Uh, and I'll say what I think about various records and what sides should be issued. But uh, he makes the recordings. I, I'm not a technical person at all. You get on very well with him. Do you get on very well with a lot of people? On the whole, yes. Uh, obviously one gets on well with people unless one doesn't like them. <laughs> yes, but do you go out of your way to get on well with people? Yes. In this peculiar business, the world of the impresario, uh, you still seem to me to be a strange fish in a very weird sort of sea. Do you get on well with the impresarios you have to mix with? On the whole, I think so. Um, there may be quite a lot of envy about, uh, and I'm aware of that, and it's for that reason that I think that it's up to me to try personally to make up mm -hmm for that envy, because it isn't a nice thing for other people to feel particularly. But if I was envious of somebody um, who was doing sort of something that I admired and wished that I could do, I'd be very envious and almost irritated if he was a bit nasty to me. But if he was a nice chap uh, or sort of was always pleasant and courteous and good to talk to and so on to me, then I just envy him with admiration and pleasure. Mm -hmm. Is your relationship with your artists an unusual one, would you say? In, in I think so, case? yes. I think it's a fairly personal one for uh, considering that I act in the role of uh, manager and agent. A lot of uh, pop singers and so on have, have a manager and an agent, to whom, by the way, they pay separate percentages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are the pleasures of management, then? What kick do you get out of it? Uh, Lots. The development of an artist, uh, to 
to a certain extent, I suppose there must be something in the actual dependence of an artist, which is very gratifying in a way, yeah. uh, and and their tremendous loyalty. Um, and also, I like my artists as people very much. I think they're all great people, and I really mean that. Uh, it was recently written about me that I probably enjoy best the company of my artists. I think it's quite true, actually, because it was written in a context where I don't have uh, much of a social life and that most of my time is spent with my artists. Well, apart from a general feeling of pleasure, is there any specific moment in management when you really get a kick? Have you had a, a, a real kick out of any aspect of management lately? Well, you always get a kick when a record comes into the hit train or a record hits number one. That's, that is a great feeling. It's, it's a simple thing, really. But it's a great feeling because you've, you've been right. The artist's been right and you've been right. And the recording manager's been right. The song was right. The yeah. artist was right. And it was put over in the right way. And one feels that all one's work has sort of suddenly been worthwhile. It's just like, I suppose, winning a race. It's, just the, it's not just the record and the artist and the song getting to number one. But so much happens because a record has hit number one. An artist is suddenly important and they're wanted everywhere because the record looks as though it's going to be number one in other parts of the world. It all, the, 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 a record in the charts means a great deal to an artist in this day and age. Was uh, there an immense amount of pre-planning in that American trip? When did you start thinking about it, for example? Well, obviously one's thought about America uh, in connection with the Beatles for a long time because I always thought... I was always quite sure, that really, that the Beatles would make it big over there. I was... We were all rather perturbed about it because nothing... We seemed to be issuing the records and nothing much was happening. And I went over... Uh, a, to have a look around and see why and try and sense the American market. I also took with me um, one of my own artists, Billy J. Kramer, um, to do some promotional work, which I thought would be a, a good idea. And both worked quite well, actually. So far as sort of looking around and seeing what was the matter, uh, I think that it was it was very simple. My, my answer um, to the boys when I came, I was I didn't think that we'd yet produced a record which was right for the American market. But I did think, having listened to an awful lot of American pop music and what was currently popular over there, that I want to hold your hand which was just about to be issued, was mm -hmm. the right one. Plus the fact that an awful lot of information had filtered through from the British press, from the Royal Command and the Palladium and the scenes in London and Beatlemania, as it's called, in general. Uh, there was great interest at that stage, and it was just the right moment for the issue of what I want to hold your hand. Timing seems to come into this somewhere. Um, was the American trip... A su such a success because it was perfectly timed, or what? I think that it helped tremendously. Uh, I didn't... I'm, I couldn't possibly say that I timed that because I knew it would be exactly right, but it, it, it was right, as it happens. That Ed Sullivan... Those, going over at that particular moment for those two Ed Sullivan shows could not have been more right. The records were just at the top. They'd been at the top for a couple of weeks, and they were still at the top. And it fitted in very well indeed. There's another venture on the stocks now, and again, timing may have come into this. You're making a film. Yes. A, a conscious, deliberate decision, or have other people persuaded you to do it? Well, we've had film offers, obviously, since the boys uh, first started to have big hits over here. Um, a lot of them we didn't like, and... I w did start to get perturbed because obviously films were important and I think that the Beatles are going to be very good in films. The thing which really started off this film, I think, was the idea of Alan Owen. Um, because the Beatles were very keen about this and so was I. I thought that he was an excellent writer and the right person for this film. Are you involved in producing this film at all? Slightly, yes. Um, in, in, in an, advi an advisory capacity, but uh, I've taken a, it upon myself to produce Jerry and the Pacemakers film. Aren't you ever timid about going into new areas, highly technical areas like this, without a great deal of knowledge or experience? Not really, because one studies quite a lot uh, from an outsider's point of view. And after all, I'd, I'd 
started to manage the Beatles and the others without any experience at all. How long, looking further ahead in the future, is it going to be before the sort of noise the Beatles make is out of fashion? It does seem to me that generally there's a slight sort of change even now uh, in a general trend. But I don't basically believe in trends in pop music. I think that... And what's Scylla Black got to do with, say, the Mersey sound or the beat sound or anything like that? What are these slight signs of the change that you detect in pop music at the moment? I think that the, that the heavy uh, beat, the pounding beat, is lessening the popularity of it. And I think that there's a, that there's, um, a more subtle sort of sound coming, which is uh, rather nice, I think. It's rather good, uh, and good harmony, too. What sort of examples? Uh, well, discounting anybody that I have anything to do with, uh, I'd say that the searchers are a very good example of what I think is, is a coming sound for the next few months. I think they're a very good group, actually. The Mersey sound, this phrase I gather you don't like, uh, was, of course, coined presumably by newspaper men because of the crop of groups coming from the yes. Liverpool area. I, I found it a peg to hang with yeah. them on. Uh, it, the Liverpool area seemed to give the movement some sort of strength, but you yourself have now just moved down to London. Isn't this a mistake? Yes. It's a pity. We've, I've moved with great reluctance, actually, because I like Liverpool and I like its people, and obviously uh, I probably owe the city... Uh, quite a lot. But the trouble was that it was becoming almost impossible to organise um, my own life uh, and do the best that I could for the artists, um, sort of moving between Liverpool and London. So much has to be done in London. The artists uh, perform so often, and they make their records in London and so on and so forth, uh, that I suppose that one was forced into it. I'm not terribly unhappy about it. It's it's sad in a way, I suppose, but it doesn't really mean that we think any less of Liverpool or we want to be less in Liverpool. My home is in Liverpool, and uh, I intend to return there as much as I can. But it may have an effect on this talent-spotting um, ability of yours, may, mayn't it, if you're taken right out of this Liverpool area, where so many groups are just beginning... Yes, this is something that slightly worries me because uh, I used to be around ballrooms and clubs very much more than I am now um, because I seem to be involved in heavy business conferences all the time. But I hope I, I shall try um, very consciously to avoid being away from it all because it's the part of the business which I enjoy. I'd much rather go to a ballroom and watch groups and people during an evening than um, sit having a heavy dinner discussing something which probably won't come off anyway. <laughs> this, this managing bit, managing the artist, what, what does a manager do for the artist? Let's assume the Beatles, four bright boys, one, one is told. Yes. Why couldn't they cope with these sort of things themselves? Well, they wouldn't be bothered to do so anyway, as they are at, at present. But do you mean as, as they are at present, or do you mean as they were two and a half years ago? Well, let's take them as two separate things. From uh, two and a half years ago, could they have got themselves to where they are now without... No, your... I don't think they would have bothered. They were, they were playing around the clubs in Liverpool and having great fun. But I don't think that they would have bothered to do anything about it, and they may not have done it in the right way. Because young, inexperienced people from a business point of view are not really very good at presenting themselves properly in the right sort of quarters and so on. Also, one advised them on a lot of things. You look after their business affairs, but the, the degree of management or work that you can do on an artist, to a certain extent, depends upon, I would say, on the personal relationship between manager and artist. Mm -hmm. I do quite a, a great deal for all of them. But this is because there's a strong sort of personal link. Right, now then, let's consider the Beatles as they are now, the position they are now. Do they really need a manager for future development? I would say that they need a manager 
more now than ever because there's so much work involved in what we call the management uh, one could say the organization of the Beatles that they couldn't possibly do it for themselves do they need you as a manager or have they got to a stage now where anybody could manage them who knew the technical side of the thing I don't think that anybody could manage them because I don't think that the Beatles would would be managed by anyone else is it this personal relationship? I don't know whether I should be saying that, actually, but uh, I think that it's true. Do you get much satisfaction from the sense of power uh, running this organisation may give you? No, and I don't feel it particularly, because, uh, well, I suppose it could be said that uh, ha sort of controlling human beings is a powerful thing, but I don't think of it as such. Or I try not. I don't, I, no, I don't even try not to. I just don't. Are you, in your own opinion, a particularly good businessman? Fair. As a businessman, fair. I, I, I've got a business background and uh, probably a, a reasonable business brain. I'm no, I'm no sort of genius. <laughs> what are your defects, then? Why aren't you um, better than you apparently think you are? I'm probably sort of too conscious of ideas rather than... Um, finance behind ideas. Do you think the RADA episode unsettled you at all from pure business? No, I think it was a very good thing, although, even though I didn't actually like being a student. Uh, it, was a, it was a very good thing. One learned a great deal. It was quite interesting, as a matter of fact. I've often thought that uh, I realised about acting in RADA about six months after I'd left RADA. Were you any good as an actor? Not at the time. I like to think that I may have been. Has it left you with a, a, a distaste for, or a real taste for, theatre? A real taste for theatre. Real theatre? Yes, very much so. I would, I would like so much to produce and, <laughs> dare I say it, act in a, sh um, a play, a what, straight play. What sort of plays? Possibly something by Chekhov or a modern straight drama. What sort of dramatist? Uh, I don't know, Osborne. Something that one knows about. You've come in to this business from most unusual surroundings and circumstances, Mr. Epstein. An enormous number of things have happened to you and the people you're working with in the last two and a half years. Could you envisage a different sort of life from the one you're leading now? No, certainly not. Um, I'd like to develop the work that I'm doing in that I, I, in, in, uh, I look forward with pleasure to films and presenting shows and possibly getting to the legit side. But this is certainly the work that I like best. And never back to the family business? I don't think so.